packet pushers. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Packet Protector, a new podcast at the intersection of security and networking from the packet pushers. I'm Jennifer J.J. Manella, and I'm here with Packet Pushers' own Drew Conry Murray. We also have a special guest for you this week. Each week here, we're going to be discussing security topics, trends, and a couple of news headlines, plus give you some technical and strategic information you can put to work. So whether security is your full-time job or just one of your responsibilities, Packet Protector is for you. And we love to hear from you. Anytime, you can go to packetpushers.net slash FU for follow-up and send us a note. And remember, too, that we're pre-recording the first few episodes, so if you tuned in earlier and you sent us a note, we're not ignoring you. We just haven't figured out the time machine yet to capture that and bring it back into this recording. But hopefully we'll be catching up with these uh, weekly episodes, so it'll be a little bit more of a conversation with you guys moving forward. And we've told you that some weeks we're going to have guest subject matter experts, and this is one of those weeks. Drew and I were talking. We know a lot of us are planning our 2024 training and certification goals, so this week we thought it would be fun to bring in Rob Lee of SANS Institute. And as chief curriculum director and faculty lead at SANS, we're sure he's going to have some pretty interesting thoughts. But also, Rob has over 20 years of actually being a practitioner. And and I think, Rob, we've been dubbed the the godfather of DFIR. So you probably have some really great (laughs) insights as to how people should navigate if they're really interested in kind of moving into more of a security practitioner role. But Drew, first, we we do like to kind of just uh, check out some of the news that's happening in the headlines. And I think the first one is just uh, making me giggle a little bit. It's the Pixie Fail, which was a a series of about nine vulnerabilities. Yep. So I I have my own thoughts about that. But what struck you here? Yeah, so it's called Pixie Fail because it's vulnerabilities inside uh, some open source firmware uh, in the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, or UEFI. It's used by vendors like RMN, Microsoft, uh, who use uh, who provide this firmware in their uh, products so that, you know, if you're a data center operator and you have X number of servers and you need to boot them up, uh, you can do it remotely using PXE or Pixie. Uh, so this uh, set of vulnerabilities is in uh, an open source firmware version from Tanio Core ED- EDK2. Uh, some researchers at an organization called Quarks Lab uh, found these vulnerabilities. It's in the IPv6 stack of the firmware. And so <laughs> essentially, uh, if it's, it's, it's a real issue if you are probably a data center operator or cloud operator uh, looking to, and then you uh, regularly are, you know, remote loading uh, OSs and such. Ah, but nobody's actually using IPv6, except for, I think we all accidentally have it enabled when we're not using it. So it is floating there. But looking at these list of nine vulnerabilities, I feel like I was just transported back to like 1989 or something because they're buffer overflows, right. um, infinite loops, <laughs> um, Predictable TCP sequence numbering and weak <laughs> pseudo random number generators. Like, this is stuff we were dealing with well over 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago. Um, so, I, I just, I don't even know what to do with this type of stuff anymore. But I think we've, you know, this proves the point that on the networking side, a lot of the protocols that we've been using, you know, DNS, DHCP, Pixie, they weren't meant to be used over untrusted networks. And we're in mm-hmm. an era now where we're telling people, treat all networks as though they're untrusted. So I think we have to rethink some of these architectures. Yeah, it's also a little frustrating because the last thing IPv6 needs is for people to be like, oh, that's an inf- uh, insecure stack. Uh, we're, we're trying to get IPv6 rolled out more robustly and widely uh, and having it uh, having these uh, vulnerabilities in that stack is, is not a great look uh, for v6. Yeah. And then, Drew, you found a really interesting article that, that got into some of the more nitty gritty details of risk associated and vulnerabilities built into LLMs. You want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, so a new report is out uh, highlighting potential security risks with large language models or LLMs uh, that underpin generative AI applications like ChatGPT. Uh, researchers at the Berryville Institute of Machine Learning say they've identified 81 risks uh, that CISOs and other executives may want to consider when they're adopting pre-built, pre-trained AI models. So risks are things like recursive pollution, where erroneous text that's generated by your LLM then gets re-ingested into that training model. Uh, things like prompt manipulation, whether someone's doing this maliciously or accidentally, uh, where sensitive information might be revealed uh, through the prompt, and something and a risk they've identified they're just calling opacity, meaning Enterprise consumers of an LLM may have little understanding about how that LLM was trained or why it produces the results it does, and that in turn may lead to unanticipated behavior by the LLM. Um, This is a free report if you're interested and you want to check it out. You do have to register to get it, but again, it's just an email and a password to set up and get it. I think there's a lot of interesting information here. 
Uh, to my mind, I honestly, I just skimmed the report because it's very long and we were on our show deadline. But to me, it's like, these are things that if your organization is going to be adopting an LLM to use for a regular business, your CIOs, your CISOs should be thinking about these kind of things. And it raises, I think, good questions for you to bring to them when you're thinking about doing what's our strategy for having an LLM in our enterprise and then using it wisely and safely. All right, Rob. So our, our, the first thing that I think everybody wants to know, so a lot of our listeners are, you know, different technical pr practitioners um, and professionals, uh, probably a lot of network engineers just because of the packet pushers audience. But, you know, certainly security is not only top of mind, but it's definitely of interest for people expanding their skill set. So like big picture, what's hot going into 2024 in the world of training and or certifications? Well, that's a, well, it's a, it's a great question. There's a lot of, <laughs> in general, I think everyone's like looking for what is the hot, you know, training uh, capabilities, what are people becoming certified in? And by and large, it has not really shifted off of uh, cloud experience. Um, and the definitive need for in-depth and very particular skill sets uh, related to the three major cloud providers. Uh, and the real challenge with that in particular is the consistent updates to the back end that forces individuals who are, you know, working in these environments to consistently have to have their skills up to date. Um, and, you know, you might have a new logging method that they may have installed or, you know, deprecated that you're relying on in the past uh, for helping you do you know, proper based cloud defense. And suddenly it's no longer there, or suddenly there's a new thing that was there that later if you'd known about, if you had enabled it, it might have helped out in this particular situation. It just it, the constantly evolving uh, landscape of cloud, uh, you know, architecture, much less the security side, is problematic uh, to keep everyone's skills up to date. And from a training perspective, it forces us on the training side to do a massive rollout of updates uh, consistently across every single year uh, for the courseware. Yeah, I'm thinking about um, AWS every time they have, you know, their annual conference, they're like, and we've just introduced 500 new features, which you must be like, okay, let's dig in and, and see what we have to do here. Yeah. And beyond cloud, you know, there's, you know, a lot of people are asking currently about, well, where's all the particular AI courses, almost like AI is a separate skill set. You know, it's, you know, it's the same thing I always uh, uh, tell people, you know, everyone thinks, okay, I'm uh, individually, I'm going to be replaced with the AI. I said, no, you individually will not be replaced with an AI, but AI empowered humans <laughs> will replace you. Uh, and this is where uh, in almost every single aspect of uh, cybersecurity, you know, cloud, ICS, um, cyber defense, even offensive stuff, that AI is going to be embedded modules. It's, it's all going to be running concurrent to your current skill sets from security analyst. Uh, to threat hunting, uh, to, you know, data analytics, all of these things are going to be emboldened with AI features and technology. Case in point, just a few weeks ago, uh, I'm sure you guys saw it, Rob Joyce uh, from the NSA uh, talked about uh, using AI in particular in security defense and threat hunting to find malicious actors that it impacted the infrastructure. And these are the malicious actors that are not there for stealing data. In fact, they're quite quiet. They surreptitiously insert themselves in these locations and are you just sit and wait. And the only way that has, you know, kind of been, you know, either we're lucky in finding them, but since they're not making so much noise on the break-in or what they're doing once they get in, they're just sitting there uh, waiting for, you know, geopolitical event to occur, you know, X. Uh, AI was one of the ways that they leaned on trying to detect it, looking for these enorm uh, ab abnormalities that normally even a very, very well-trained uh, threat hunting analyst uh, may not even pick up on. Yeah, and I think we've seen, I mean, we've seen the power of what AI can do in finding those, you know, hidden patterns and hidden behavior and things. But let me ask you this: I'm going to rewind a little bit because you said, you know, AI's the the skill sets around that and the learning opportunity is very modular and kind of more integrated into the various disciplines and skill sets we have now. Do you feel like it's kind of how we've viewed infosec for these years, where it was kind of, I'm just air quoting here, you can't see me like new and everybody said, okay, what is a security thing? And then as, as the industry progressed, we've, we kind of said, well, really there's a sec security component of everything and everybody and every application and every network. 
Um, and so it's starting to seep down into that. Do you think AI is going to follow kind of a similar path? I do. Uh, I think within, you know, a year or two, most individuals, if even if, you know, you take the common uh, technology user, you know, let, let's even go as far as, you know, let's say uh, aunt, uncle, your mom, dad, um, someone who is, you know, not technically adept, they're going to be utilizing more AI on a regular basis in their day to day. Um, whether it's going to be, you know, wholly up front on the, the front end screen, or it's going to be integrated into their office products or their email, um, you know, just like even basic search functionality uh, through Google, you know, and Bing have been completely changed with AI. So that's one of the things It's just, it's this integration of this new technology base that again, as you're mentioning earlier, it's like, well, what is the actual security threat surrounding that? What do CISOs need to know about, uh, you know, what's the risk to generate AI? How do we reduce the cost per, uh, you know, uh, query that's going to go into it? All these things are going to factor into it. But the the bottom line is that, as you're saying, it's like it's going to be found in every single technology-based career field, not just uh, information security. And you'll start to use it more and more frequently, and it'll just be another tool that you're going to realize is running behind the scenes to help you with data analytics. Uh, very similar, to, you know, to when we really started using massive large-scale databasing uh, to be able to help uh, with threat hunting and security analytics, uh, just because we had too many alerts coming in on an enterprise network. You had to have something something to help correlate it all. Um, and AI sitting on top of that is, you know, going to make it easier, but it's still, you, you know, the original collection was the right direction. It's like everything goes into a SIM and then that SIM will correlate it and then it will help do basic detection patterns and then we'll take an analyst to look at it. Now we're going to have AI sitting on top of that. It'll help you reach those conclusions, hopefully even quicker. But it's also going to accelerate our attackers at the same time, embolden them. Uh, you know, just as much as you know, trying to find a vulnerability could be easier. Uh, chasing you know old vulnerabilities or potentially writing large scale botnets to find uh, you know scour the entire internet looking for something with you know Pixie, for example, uh, that vulnerability. These are the types of things that it's also going to make our attackers much more quick to be able to find exploit and uh, get into our network. So, you know, equally, it's going to you know be on both sides. It's not all of a sudden like, well, defense is going to be easier. The attackers are, well, they're they're going to be you know left out to out, out to pasture. That's just not going to happen. Yeah. Well, and sometimes they're more motivated and or have simply more time than we do. So, okay. So AI is hot. Cloud is hot. Let me ask this from a perspective of, you know, like a network engineer. So I came from a infrastructure and networking background. Um, I'm, I'm definitely not cloud native, um, even though I've had a, a long history with partners that work in that space and even have taken, you know, training. Um, so my question here from, from a cloud perspective and then kind of pivoting into what network engineers should be thinking about, where would somebody start? Because like you said, there's, there's all the three main uh, cloud platforms, there's all of these things that are changing so quickly. So especially for network engineers, if somebody's saying, I want to learn cloud and just start to get my feet underneath me and understand, you know, the terminology and what's going on in that space, uh, coming from a different background, what are, what are some opportunities you see, whether it's SANS or not? Um, do you, are there specific cloud trainings or entry points that you think make sense or, um, or not cloud? that a network engineer should be looking at in the next year or two? Well, I mean, obviously we have a, a litany of resources and, you know, for three things that we start, you know, again, on the SAN side, we have our, our cloud SecNex uh, summits uh, completely free virtually. You get to, you know, come in online, you know, see what the latest stuff. They have workshops that are embedded in it. Um, so, you know, from a free resources standpoint, you know, we do offer a lot for people just getting started and wants to, you know, dip their foot in and say, okay, I maybe not on my course radar this year, but maybe next year, but I start needing to get into cloud exposure. There's a lot of free resources that are out there. And I would definitely look at, you know, those cloud-based events, those summits um, uh, to potentially, you know, reinvigorate. But what I found is even more challenging is that you have a lot of people in the field who've been working in cybersecurity for 10, 15 years, and they've not really updated their skill sets and, you know, trying to convince them that, hey, you need to get a little bit more cloud stink on you. Um, you're, you know, the evolution <laughs> of your own skill sets is starting to wane. You need to go back into reskilling uh, one more time. 
And they look at you, you know, like, why, you know, I'm good. Right. I said, and actually, no. And this is where really trying to convince, you know, folks have been in the industry for a while that, Hey, you know, those who are brand new actually have a leg up on you and can easily, uh, you know, surpass your own knowledge base uh, in just a few short years because you're not reskilling yourself. And so I, I actually think there's a general trend in trying to convince people, uh, especially those who've been in the field for 15 years, to say it's time to take a look at reskilling and, you know, which area of reskilling do you want to go into, whether it be more information security management or if you want to stay technical, what are the key skills that you're going to need to maintain proficiencies? And that is where I found a lot of employers are struggling a little bit is that they almost have the magic hand wave of those legacy folks that have been around a long time because they have that trust that says, no, I'm good. But the real question, if you're a CISO manager, is say, why am I not able to see the proficiencies of everyone on my team, including my senior level managers and directors and analysts? Oh, hell yeah. Because look, but the high school kids I mentor in Cyber Patriot can whip my ass in half of these things. Yeah. <laughs> is it just a question of having some exposure to cloud or do you feel like there's fundamental retraining that has to happen because if I'm just playing devil's advocate, I'd say, yeah, sure, it's it's cloud, it's a new location, but it's still packets. I'm still thinking about how to segment my network. I'm still thinking about logging and so on. So how different is it really? Well, you're not starting from scratch. It's, you know, it's like a doctor or anyone else going to the latest, you know, understanding the latest oncology, you know, techniques, the, mm -hmm. the latest tests that can be done, um, you know, being able to order, you know, what is the latest research? It's constant updating your skills. And I, you know, because of just some of the, you know, talk about certifications, um, you know, there's this aspect of, I have my certification, I'm good. You know, how long will it last? Do I need to go through recertification? Does that really show proficiencies? All these things kind of layer in is like, the bottom line is you kind of look yourself in the mirror. It's like, do you know when you're out of your scope, you know, you're in a situation, you're leaning into that high school, like, what did they just do? <laughs> and, and that's where when it starts to happen, it says, okay, I, I should at least uh, start going into, you know, what training course is particularly going to enhance my set of skills that I need. And that's where, you know, you start getting that workforce development, you know, where do we need the best defense? Is it more the security architecture side, focusing on zero trust, big, you know, another big topic. But again, zero trust also has a lot of cloud implications. How do we potentially handle zero trust in a cloud-based environment uh, where there's, you know, really hard for us to 100% uh, and, you know, segment parts of the network from each other uh, from the, you know, software as a service, you know, applications on someone's desktop, which the logins are the same I and mean, using single sign-on, you know, all these different terms. It just comes down to a fact of where do you potentially find yourself out of, you know, staring at your, your coworkers doing and say, I, I'm not really sure what they just did, but that looked good. Um, <laughs> so Rob, so I feel like we have a, a unique opportunity with you. And I, I think Drew and I want to poke into a be behind the scenes look. Um, I know one of, I've, you know, obviously, well, maybe obviously to some of the listeners, you know, I spent several years on ISC Squared's board. So I have, uh, I'm painfully aware of what it takes to maintain an ANSI accredited certification I've worked with three other vendors on certification programs, but kind of coming at it from your perspective in its sands, you know, what, what is involved in building and maintaining a certification and training program? What are the moving parts here that, uh, that are behind the scenes and we don't get to see? Again, another really good question. And the problem is, is that, you know, and you probably realize this as well is that ANSI's accreditation almost was born out of a standard of a set of criteria that would never change. And that's where we've actually had to put, you know, push back on ANSI saying, well, I thought we just defined what a network security analyst is supposed to do, but now your learning objectives have changed over the past two years. How is that possible now? You know, so they're used to what is a bricklayer? What is, you know, like for whatever, you know, they're accrediting in terms of if you pass this, this is an accredited standard for, you know, this type of, capability. Um, and where I think uh, they've had to become a little bit more aware is just the rapid uh, shift in technology base and baseline skills that have occurred in terms of defining what one of um, what one of the core learning objectives is. They really don't question, um, and this is again thing across the uh, across all the organizations that look for accreditation, is that you have a lot of certs out there that are not accredited. It is, you know, there is very little oversight into making sure that the psychometrics, which basically means that 
for something to be accredited, and you know this as much as I do, that it, you can't have a 90% pass rate, but you also can't have a 90% fail rate either. You know, you have to have the test that is going to test the learning objectives that, you know, you look at the massive number of people that go through it and that it's trying to hit this sweet spot that says that is a hard enough test. It does fail enough people that it matches the learning objectives, that the test questions are fair and, you know, written in a proper way. You know, all of these things, the hands-on aspect of it is also fair and is going to meet the criteria. Um, all these things kind of end up into why accredited certifications are absolutely necessary. But behind the scenes, you get some of these accredited certifications that says, we're all things to all people. And then you get into, well, what are they actually capable of doing? And that's where the workforce development, and you hire someone, well, I'll get a cert that covers all of the bases, but then they come get employed by you. They actually don't have skills to do very much because they're not niche enough yet. Yeah. And that's where... Um, you, you kind of have this, you know, the college conundrum issue is that you have a lot of college graduates that, hey, I have a degree, but they actually have no skills. Yeah, let me ask this because again, I, I'm I'm aware of of what what we have to do in one scenario here, but I'm kind and I've worked with a few other orgs, but so kind of looking at start to finish um, for what you do, mm-hmm. like how do you decide what needs to be a course? How do you curate the content? How do you do? You, like, do you go through the? Do you just take feedback? Are you finding gaps and um, requests coming in from students? Are you following other market trends um, and predicting that behavior a little bit? So how are you making those decisions when you when you guys roll out a course? We don't wait for the industry to say some of these skills are absolutely necessary. For example, when we start getting into um, cloud architecture, you know, for example, you know, you know, uh, for a skill, we have an entire course on that, you know, certification and so forth, that, you know, we actually find our experts through uh, the various summits. And in some cases, we start asking them, like, what is this particular role that you're fulfilling for this organization? And they said, well, they didn't have the role for me initially, but what I'm really doing is, you know, using my architecture skills from network security, and I'm now more applying it to cloud. Then we start at this discussion is, is that a sp- specific enough capability that we potentially need to develop a course on it? And then we then will then ask ourselves, is that uh, enough of, you know, in-depth material to potentially create a certification off of that particular set of skills. And so you look at the original way that we did it was we segmented folks into like, you know, genre classes, like, almost like in Dungeons and Dragons, you have, you know, warrior, mage, you know, uh, elf, you know, and so forth, that you have these different classes of individuals. And we call those curriculums. Um, and the reason we do that is that once you start becoming into your niche, like forensics and digital uh, and instant response, or if you're more security analytics and network architecture, or your cloud or ICS, each of these have a different enough skill set that we kind of clump them together and say, okay, once you enter in this island, doesn't mean you'll never go to another island. It basically means that more likely than not, you're going to become more niche in that one particular area. So once we have a certification, say, for example, we had originally in... Um, when we started, uh, when I started on the forensic side, we had one forensic certification. Well, at that point, that's, you know, we had network forensics, we had host-based forensics, we had malware analysis, all in a single class. As those fields grew, each one of those subfields became its own class and therefore its own certification uh, that kind of beget out of that. And that's one of the reasons why that you might have an initial, like, okay, here's a certification that's more broad, but then you can't fit all of the knowledge that it takes to be a network forensic analyst into a single two day period as a part of longer, larger course, it becomes its own course. And that's where, you know, those additional niche areas have kind of come out of that. Another good example is cyber threat intelligence, threat hunting, OSNs, each one of these topic areas originally, maybe it was a day of material, but now they're full fledged, you know, what do you do for an organization? Why well, do OSN the entire time? Like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Well, how do you know you're good at your job? Well, I went and took this, you know, class, you know, I took the accredited cert. um, And that's where, you know, like through that process. But it really begins way back like we had before, like an original class. And we potentially start talking to more and more experts out there in the field that says, this is actually deeper. We're not going deep enough in order to train individuals to be able to be um, accomplished in the the workplaces. We really want to have that individual go above and beyond that, you know, once they get it uh, certified that in that workplace, that they're able to throw them real work, real tasks on the first day they're employed and have them be able to say, okay, wh- how do you guys do it here? That's differently. 
okay, cool. I'm, I'll be able to get up to speed, but I have the core skills. I need to do my job. Yeah. And I think, and I'm curious on Drew's perspective with this, because that kind of, you know, to tie two things together there that you just said, you know, I think looking at things from, well, from a professional taking training and exams, and also from somebody from the, from the outside hiring those people is there's got to be a balance between, you know, that foundational knowledge, but then also some specificity. Cause if, if you are, like you just said, going to throw them into a role in a organization, they need to hit the ground running, then they need to understand functionally how to execute that on the platforms in that environment. Because I know at least, you know, in the world, you know, we, we live in on, on infrastructure stuff. And I mean, you know, clouds, the same thing, stuff varies from platform to platform. You wake up on a Tuesday or a Wednesday and things have been changed or moved because you're working in a cloud environment. It's not, you know, something you're managing that's persistent inside of your environment where it's like, oh, think this is only going to change when I install the update during my maintenance window once a quarter or whatever that is. Um, so I'm curious, like, I'm curious, Drew, also your perspective, but then Rob, like, how do you find that balance in the training program? But then also when you're testing against that skill set in an exam? That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, Rob, frankly, I have the same question because it seems like, you know, there is a push and pull in in the, you know, technical community where how much time do I have to spend on this fundamental knowledge versus can't you just tell me the commands I need to use so I can use this tool and, and be effective right away? And that's that's one of the reasons why, you know, Sands in particular, and I'll talk about what we did, is moving away from just multiple guess, multiple uh, choice questions, uh, because that does not actually test someone's proficiencies and skills to be able to say, okay, now what do I do? So one of the reasons why uh, CyberLive, which is our hands-on, you know, it's because the test is now, you know, partial test-based and partial hands-on that we throw them a real-world problem. And since we're tool agnostic, and, you know, you have your tool sets that you, you might have, you could use any set of tool to potentially answer the question. However, you still need to take the original question. Here's a, you know, for example, a network packet. And it might uh, ask you, in particular, this network packet is trying to, uh, if detected on your network, is trying to, you know, uh, analyze it, come back and, you know, uh, answer the following three questions in, in relation to those particular packets of what they're doing inside the network. And if you don't have the tool set or anything else, you're just staring at packets and you're like, okay, I need to be able to, you know, run this through an analyzer. I need to be able to run this through, is there, you know, a, a payload that's, you know, particular that contains uh, an executable or a PDF, and you, down, you extract that PDF and says, okay, no, this is part of a spear phishing attempt. And then that's how you answer the question. That proficiency is needed because in the real world, you're given a, no one's telling you the command to type when a problem's, you know, in front of you. Right. They're going to be, you know, the command is <clears throat> the least critical part of that, which is you might still be able to Google, hey, I think I need to follow this path. And you can Google, what is the command I need to do to get there? But that connection, that dot connection between point A and point B, which here's the problem. Here's what I think I need to do. I haven't done that command in a while. Let me go pull out my book and figure out exactly what I need to type or which tool it is. And you start walking down that path of problem solving. That is key to anyone working in this field to this day. It's almost just, just like why we have residency for doctors. It's like you just can't kick them out of you know formal school and say, good luck. They need to be in an environment where they're looking at a bunch of symptoms and, you know, like dot, you know, like the show house, all this data thrown at you, what, it, what is going on here? And you have to, you know, in the real world, that's what if people are going to be looking at you to answer those questions. You, you, if that's why they hire you, if they could Google it, they wouldn't, you wouldn't be there. So we need to be able to basically give the employers that confidence that they, that those people are graduating with these certs with hands-on capabilities, at least has enough knowledge to recognize, you know, core problems and potentially how to start engaging on it. Uh, so they're, you know, uh, helping the organization out. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a huge fan of understanding the the foundational pieces because, you know, doing what I had to do, which was not work in a single environment, but work in client environments as an integrator, you know, you had to, you had to go configure whatever they had there and integrate things together. And so, you know, I see some people, you know, obviously the new excited network engineers, you know, out on social media who are, you know, oh, if you don't know this command string to do this on this type of, you know, Cisco router off the top of your head, then you just need to lock yourself in a room and quit your job or something. And I'm like, I have to, you know, that's why they made tab or that's why they made the, the manual because I will RTFM all day long. Yeah. Because you you can't remember everybody's 
com- command line and then it changes during a code upgrade. And definitely in the cloud environments now, I mean, you know, some of the network infrastructures we're managing don't even have CLI access and SNMP. We're managing them through APIs and they and and the interface, if you go into the website, it changes possibly weekly. Pardon the interruption. You're probably a Packet Pushers listener for the technical conversations, but strategy matters too. The podcast Heavy Strategy debates pivotal questions in enterprise IT, from technology to workplace culture, from geopolitical trends to economics. The hosts bring their expertise, analytical acumen, and contrasting viewpoints to debate complex topics. Frequently irreverent and always thought-provoking, these are the conversations you wish you could have at the leadership table. So tune in and join the think tank where unanswered questions are better than unquestioned answers. Listen to Heavy Strategy at packetpushers.net or wherever you get your podcasts. So Rob, I guess what I'm hearing you say is uh, maybe if, if I'm looking for what seems like a useful, worthwhile certification or training course to spend my time on, it should be something that's focusing on fundamentals, on basics, so that when I'm thrown into the situation of here's a packet capture, uh, tell us, you know, I need to find out what these headers mean. This, this packet's intent was a center. It's not about just having memorized a whole bunch of commands. It's more about uh, in your doctor metaphor, understanding how all of the parts of the body work together and what problems look like when they arise. And similarly, just like the doctor, you, the further you progress, you know, have your initial, okay, residency, you're going into just generic to doctor, but then you start getting in your niche areas, you know, mm-hmm. whether you're going into, different specialties that has its own uh, in-depth knowledge. It, the more that you specialize, the more in-depth you cannot be an inch deep. You need to be a mile deep at that point. And that's where the cloud stuff starts coming in. You can't survive in the cloud environment today. If you're dealing with it on a daily basis as an analyst and saying, I really do not know how to uh, query in AWS, the questions that I need to be able to do my job. So I need to go potentially, you know, take that additional class to potentially, to work through those niche skills and then be able to produce uh, the hands-on results. There's a secondary uh, thing that kind of comes up here, which is also fascinating when you start getting into formal schooling, uh, bachelor's, master's level degree mm-hmm. versus, uh, and we're talking about certifications about employers, is that how many, you know, I'll ask you guys this from your, your perspective, and I'll, I'll try to answer. I know you guys are doing the interview, but, uh, but this is something that just came up uh, and, you know, created a huge debate is how many employers in the information security uh, hiring space uh, that are looking to hire people are looking at degrees versus certifications uh, for their criteria, uh, core criteria for determining if that person's hireable or not. And in other words, how much do degrees matter anymore? It, in my perspective, in talking with InfoSec professionals and being around the space, it seems like this is one of the areas in IT in particular where Having a degree, having a not having a degree, frankly, wasn't a barrier to entry. Uh, if you could skill up and get certifications, then not having a bachelor's in, in computer science or whatever wasn't an issue. I don't know if that's changing with new hiring requirements and changes in computer uh, science programs. Like, well, I guess my own case is my son, my youngest, is taking uh, is majoring in computer security, so that's his major. It's under a CS program, but it's computer security as a major, and he is learning practical things. So when he comes out, he will have computer security, you know, a degree in computer security. But what does that mean versus having all these uh, hands-on certifications and training courses? I don't know. I guess we're going to find out in a few years. And wait, hang, hang on. Uh, let me, let me get my soapbox over here and get on top of it. <laughs> oh, <Uh-oh>, go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not going to wind myself up about this, but yeah, it's, it's crazy to me. You know, I think the, the, the you know, Jen's personal perspective here is you absolutely don't need a degree in anything to, or, or even, you know, formal schooling and higher education to pursue anything in technology. I mean, I, I wanted to do art. Um, and, and my dad was basically like, did you want to eat because you like food? And I was like, well, yes. And he's like, well, I'm not paying for you to go to school for art. So pick something else. But it it doesn't matter. I mean, one of our best engineers was a, a psychology major. He had nothing to do with anything related to computers and engineering at all. Um, but we came out of a world in security where a lot of the original professionals were from the military. And there's a lot of rigor and a lot of structure and a lot of formal education in those ranks when you get to a certain point. Um, so, you know, federal people, 
coming up in that space, you know, have expectations around how this needs to happen. And there are still a lot of professionals that are, you know, of a certain vintage that will say, you you know, if somebody's trying to get into to cybersecurity and somebody says, you know, oh, my, my kid, my whatever is interested, what do they need to do? And the answer you're going to get from a subset of professionals is, well, you know, this university or that university has a program. But what you're going to hear from the rest of us is be curious, just go start to play with some shit and see what you can not break other people's stuff, but just see what you can do Uh and see what you're curious about and what you want to learn more about. And so, you know, I think curiosity more than anything matters because this industry and this technology does change so quickly that if you want to be the expert and then coast for a while, like doctors like to do a lot of doctors, this is probably not the industry for you because everything is going to be changing every few weeks. And it's a lot to keep up with. You have to want to do that. And even more so when you start talking about, you know, what the barriers to what we're talking about here is we're not, by the way, I'm not saying don't go to school. I actually think for a certain amount of individuals that an 18 year old is not mature enough to really understand what they want to do when they grow up. Right. Some of those high schoolers that you talked about that you're interacting with, they may already know I'm cybersecurity all the way. I saw what you make. I want to be there hundred percent, you know, good for you. I think there's a lot of individuals, even like, you know, they turn 30 and it's like, I didn't expect this was my life. And I actually kind of enjoy tech stuff. I'm going to go over there and explore that a little bit. So, you know, so from a, do you need to go back to a formal school age 30 to explore this answer is no. However, what the barrier is, is that you have a lot of uh, legacy employers with their HR that in order to be able to pay, pay a certain amount as a security analyst, they say that is going to require a bachelor's and master's Mm-hmm. you know, in computer science degree, and then you have uh, equivalent certifications. And we're we're trying to get them, you know, a really good manager will go in and have these battles with HR. And I've, you know, talked to all of my friends out there. It's like, God, yeah, yeah HR is, is so aggravating. I can't get them to move off this. We're paying an individual without a degree equivalent to, in some cases, what a you know, entry-level doctor is making. The, their brain and processing and equalization of the salary levels just can't get there. And so they put on all these requirements, you know, four, four years experience, bachelor's degree in computer science and everything else, because they think they're going to be called out for lowering the bar too much. Mm. But I, right now, I think we're at this really interesting turning point for a lot of these employers are scrambling to find good talent that they're finally, uh, these security, security managers have finally broken through and said, I will take someone with uh, training and uh, certifications that are accredited over degrees. And if you could drop the degree, that'd make, you know, the amount of inbounds that we could potentially look at that much better. We'll still filter, um, but they still might be paid, uh, you know, a six figure salary and HR still, you know, has that mind melting moment that they can't, you know, I can't function with this because they're so used to require having these hardcore requirements. And I think we're, we're working on that. Like we've, we've been shipping away. And I think, you know, even some of the, um, the federal in the U.S., some of the federal government requirements for that are starting to to drop off because they understand and they recognize that they need to to have a bigger pool, especially for what a lot of times government agencies are going to be paying on public you know public sector salary. Um, so Coursera had a link um, I dropped in there for you guys. Um, I don't consider this like, you know, the reference or the Bible here of certs, but I thought it was interesting because they you know, they have a lot of, um, you know, training and and resources on their site for all kinds of different classes. But one of they so they came out with their top 10 for this year based on not, you know, not what people are taking, but based on what companies are hiring for. And so no huge surprise here, you know, CISSP is at the very top. And even coming from my background here, I mean, I, I had my CISSP in my early 20s. You know, I do think it was very misunderstood and everybody kind of went after that. You know, they did a good job lobbying to get that certification, having a lot of attention in, in yeah. the space, especially in the DOD. Um, so then we've got, you know, some of uh, more audit focused things with the the CISA cert, um, Security Plus, which is CompTIA's kind of entry level CEH, which is Certified Ethical Hacker, the CISM cert. Um, and then, so Rob, I see now we start to get into, you know, GSEC, um, I, I see GCIH down here. What are, what are those two specifically since they're on this list? 
Well, one thing that SANS does a little bit differently is that we have more certifications based on niche roles than overall, you know, here's one cert, you know, to cover them all. I mean, GSEC is our entry level certification, which in many cases, you know, our argument is you walk out of there, you could be a uh, new hire security analyst. It's a great way to then, then figure out like what your warrior class, which island are you going to go to next, whether digital forensics, offensive, you know, security architecture, whatnot. Um, and then most of, our, most of our niche certs kind of follow that trend. GSEC is probably our most broad cert because, you know, just to become a, you know, standard security analyst, you need a little bit of understanding of, you know, from network architecture to cloud, uh, to a little bit of forensics, to instant response, kind of all included. But, it, you know, it's it's more of a high level, one inch deep. Um, and it gets you to the point where you're a, a capable analyst. When you start getting into additional job roles, job functions, that's where SANS really um, delivers is on, you know, if you want to be a network forensic analyst, you know, we have a cert for that. If you're going to be a full-time malware analyst, and that's where you're going to be doing your specializations in, I have a certification for that. So for, for you know, when they go through all these job roles, how many people need a, you know, full-time penetration tester, you know, on their on their staff versus a security analyst or someone who's on their security team. And this is one of the reasons why you see some of these things so weighted one way or another is that, uh, you know, because of just like, you know, they're looking through all the job postings and saying what certifications are potentially um, uh, levied at this point. But if you're an employer looking for, I need to, uh, more specificity in these job roles. If you're doing more workforce development, which a lot of employers are starting to do, they're starting to become less, okay, I'll just hire a generic person. They start actually having different components of their security team to have, we have a OSINT team, we have a threat hunting team, we have an IR team, we have a penetration testing team. Well, if you're hiring underneath those security, you know, you're not just hiring security analysts for pen testing. You actually need someone with pen testing experience. That's where that will come into play. But, you know, by and large, the numbers don't add up. You know, what is this percentage, you know, of our security population that are full-time pen testers versus are familiar with it? Um, you know, it's a yeah. small percentage overall. And yeah. that's one of the reasons why, you know, some of these things lead HR to make decisions saying, well, let's just do a search for CISSP or something like that. I said, that's great for entry level. Awesome. For something that's more niche, you got to work with security managers to figure out what is going to fill the roles on your team that are going to make your security team the Avengers, uh, which each of your specificities of your different superpowers that you're bringing to the table. Otherwise, you're you know dealing with a bunch of folks that you know are not going to be able to handle a significant event uh, once it arises. Yeah. So how and much Rob, do you think of certification development, course development is driven by HR, driven by job roles, things that are sort of outside the control of the organizations uh, developing certifications? Right now, I think there's a lot more listening going on to these large scale enterprises that say we have specific job role tasks that we're trying to uh, attain to. And that's one of the reasons why you see frameworks start to come out, um, such as NICE and um, the, there's a European one as well that they're saying, hey, if you're doing this particular job role, then you should have these particular job skills. And anyone doing the certifications, you know, sit there and say, well, let's find a certification that matches as many job roles as possible. Well, again, that's a, it's a unequal, you're, you're trying to say, what is the cheapest way to get that individual into your organization versus what is the job role and job tasks that they're able to do? It's very difficult. And I think the, the entire industry is going to change over the next two to three years where more specificity in the job tasks. You're going to have more managers get in there and says, hey, someone who's doing offensive penetration testing, I see here a nice, it you know, it also lists they need to be able to do host-based forensics. No, they don't. I've been doing this for a long time. I haven't done host-based forensics, so drop that off. So a lot of the folks are in, in charge of these frameworks that say job task role to skill-based education, that is going to become a lot more clear and it's going to be a lot more uh, razor sharp and saying, here are the core tasks that you need and skills you need to have that. And then which capabilities and which uh, training certifications and you know capabilities will potentially meet those. And this is where I think, you know, it's going to be kind of interesting over the next two to three years. Managers are going to get a little bit more specific and saying, here's what we think meets, meets those, but also training providers like we at SANS and others We'll also be really paying attention to, do we have an LO that covers what, you know, the military thinks is a job task for a network, you know, security analyst. It may not be, a, you know, in our training course, we should say, okay, we need to go back and add that or become more modularized, you know, to be able to offer specific parts of training that will add up to the job uh, specific role functions that 
are particularly needed. Now, up until now, it's been, you know, everyone is just using a shotgun and saying, okay, maybe I'll hit something with these, all this stuff we're training. But in reality, I think in the next two to three years, you're going to see a lot more specificity come out of those uh, joint uh, job task roles and skill assessments. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think there's one other thing I wanted to ask about here too, which is, so we're kind of talking about the the, the niche specificity of the the learning and the skill set and that, you know, certain professionals need to put those building blocks together based on what they're expected to do in their role. But I'm also curious. So when we, when we started recording today, uh, my friend Drew here said that he didn't read the document because he skimmed it and he read more than I did. So I'm not picking on him, but he said it was long at 28 pages. And I think this is a, he's not wrong, but this is the world we're living in where, I mean, back in the day, it would not be uh, abnormal for us to read read things that were, you know, many scores of pages, hundreds of pages. I've certainly read numerous manuals cover to cover that were over a thousand pages um, and some of them more than once, unfortunately. But what is this this trend and, and this kind of, I don't, this kind of goes back a little bit to the idea of, you know, the accredited things that are very like monolithic and they, they're not very dynamic and they can't be adapted and adjusted to, you know, the the ebb and the flow of what's happening actually in the world very quickly. They're not agile if they're ANSI accredited typically or not as agile. But what is what about like other short learning formats? Like, do you see trends where people are consuming training differently? Are they preferring, you know, we've got both COVID happening where everybody was working from home and remotely. Do you see trends in people consuming the training either in a different form factor or in different durations where they're going for like micro learning in small modules versus a whole day of training? I think it's going to come across the board. You know, you know, for example, you guys do a podcast, you know, there's a little bit of your customer base and, you know, uh, listener base for this is based off of someone who's like, okay, I'm wanting micro learning education, something that's thoughtful, gets me to think. You know, I think most individuals are going to be looking for a combination of formal, informal, micro and macro, um, you know, training opportunities. You want, you know, to learn a brand new skill, you know, you just can't go through a micro training and says, here's a command, here's what you're supposed to do in every single situation. You on the cloud side, you may say, okay, I need to learn AWS, but it wouldn't hurt for me also to to learn GCP uh, and Azure at the same time. And so I will go through a formal um, week long or two month long, you know, you know, if you're doing it online training course, but it comes down to, I think everyone knows, you know, are you high distracting individual? Like I'm, I'm a shiny bobble individual. Like um, when I'm doing master's classes, like I could do them really well in planes. You know, like I could go through it, like I've watched some of the master class and I'm like, okay, this is cool. Do really well in planes. But if I'm at home, like maintaining the eye contact with, you know, the, the screen to say, okay, I'm paying attention you know, getting all the nuggets that I'm supposed to get out of it, it's near impossible. So I've, you know, I kind of attributed myself, I'm, I'm a hard online learner. Um, it really would be hard to go through a long formal class online right. versus something that's a little bit smaller form factor. Um, but then again, you know, just like the, you know, I always make an argument, I like the amount of knowledge it takes to be a security engineer today is not short of equivalent to what, you know, doctors or lawyers have to go through. And it's a massive amount. You just can't take a you know single part of the law. Hey, we're going to teach you family law on this specific thing. You know, division of estate. Da 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 da. Go read that. And you're good, without really understanding all the other you know issues that you know why things and rules of evidence and everything else that you potentially need to know to be able to part be a part of that. And it's really hard to convince employers in saying all that baseline information is as important as the skill that you need that person to be able to do. Yeah, I, and I think really across all of technology and and security that everything has just gotten orders of magnitude more complex than it was, you know, even just 10 years ago. So speaking of micro learning uh, and micro content, we probably need to wrap this one up. Um, But I did want to just kind of take away with this uh, or take, let let the listeners take this away. Do you have advice? um, Because you have a long, rich history working in this space for anybody that's going to be sitting for a certification exam this year. Yeah, I mean, honestly, for anyone who's sitting any type of certification exam, you know, really take a look, at, you know, you know, if you're trying to choose it first, is, you know, look for something that is going to, I'm more of the argument that look for more, employers are going to be looking for more niche skills than broad skills. Um, and security is going to continue to have this charge ahead in the organization is becoming more and more important. 
um, and, you know, even a requirement for someone sitting on the board of companies to have an information security background. Um, given that, you got to look at your own career path and, and objectives. If your employer is willing to pay for something and they're saying we need you to cert, that's one thing. If you have a little bit of choice, and when you're sitting down for a certification, you know, it really comes into like really focus on those uh, pre assessments that will show you where you're weak. Um, you know, really double down on those skills and understand that, you know, know if your cert is going to be testing hands on, which I think if it's really decent, it should. Um, that you're able to, you know, have a certain number of problems thrown at you and you're able to potentially say, I at least know how to begin um, chopping away at that problem. And that's just like what's going to happen in the real world. You're going to be employed. Your manager is going to throw something at you or something is going to happen in the real world. It's going to be sitting in front of you. And you're going to need to know how potentially the first three steps, you know, and how to do that. And that's where a good certification, a good uh, um, uh, skill-based exam will be able to, you know, help you achieve that and convince employers that you're the one to hire. And that's what it comes down to is like, you know, with the importance of certifications that are out there, more and more employers are starting to lean on certifications, especially accredited certifications, uh, to be able to meet their uh, job uh, workforce mapping, um, which is also becoming much more in depth than it's ever been. Instead of just random security analysts, they say we're hiring for a specific role um, on the team. And, and that's where, you know, what you choose for your certifications is going to really matter. And certainly a, a mentor can help you navigate that as well. Mentors, yes, 100%. You know, but again, they're also going to have their own spin on things. You know, it's, just, you know, take everything, you know, even the show you know, is like, you know, this is, you know, three people just talking about it. You know, do we, or, you know, how, how often are we sitting in an enterprise hiring role, um, you know, versus talking to people that are in them? And that's when, you know, the thing is, is, you know, you take a look at it. It's like, take as much knowledge as possible, you know, talk to the HR, you know, figure out what, you know, should you move over to security management, you know, because they need people who are you know, moving from tech to management. Um, you know, there's, this is an amazing field to be in right now. Um, and it's almost, you know, has built in job security uh, to a great extent. So you're not wrong to be looking at cybersecurity and cybersecurity education uh, to be able to fulfill, you know, what it is that you will make you happy on a day-to-day -day basis. So I guess we do need to wrap up. Um, I think my takeaway from you is make sure I'm getting a a, a course or a certification that's been accredited, um, and that that body is ANSI. Yeah, it's it's one of the accredited things. We're we're actually actually it stands double credited because we actually have all of our courses inside uh, middle states, uh, our college. So we actually call it double accreditation because not only the certification and exam uh, fulfill ANSI accreditations, it also fulfills the college requirements, um, and you get C, uh, C, uh, college credit for taking these courses as well. Okay. Um, so that's kind of an interesting and a little aside. Not, not many people think about that, but uh, you've, if you want to start, hey, I took this class and I want to go get a degree, you know, you know, that's also a really good mark to have uh, when you're looking for different training courses and certifications uh, for matching up for skills. Okay. And my takeaway from JJ is maybe let your curiosity be your guide if you're trying to think about what what certifications, what am I interested in doing? How am I interested in extending my career? Uh, that natural curiosity is probably a good signal for yourself. Yeah. And you can always pivot later. You know, you're not stuck That's with true. it forever. <laughs> That's true. And my takeaway for me is next time I come on the podcast, I better read the whole document. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rob, thank you for joining us. If folks want to connect with you online or find you, do you have a, a website, a blog? Are you on LinkedIn? Where could they, where they give me? Uh, well, I'm go on LinkedIn. Find you? Um, you know, uh, easiest email address at SANS to memorize, rlee at sans.org. Um, LinkedIn, uh, do a search for Rob T. Lee. There's a Rob Emily out there. Very similar background. Uh, <laughs> both of us some, uh, constantly get each other's emails. Uh, but Rob T. Lee on LinkedIn, uh, you'll be able to find me there. Awesome. We'll have those links in the show notes and we'll have that Coursera link that we had talked about. Uh, Rob, thanks for joining us. JJ, is always a pleasure to be with you. And thank you for listening. Just a reminder, uh, if you'd like to connect with the JJ or me directly, uh, we have a Slack channel we operate for Packet Pushers listeners. It's free to sign up at PacketPushers.net. You can tap into a vibrant community of infrastructure, security, and networking professionals. Uh, check it out again, PacketPushers.net slash Slack. As always, thanks for listening.